Hi, and welcome to our first episode of VaynerX Presents Marketing for the Now. I'm Andrea Sullivan, the CMO of VaynerX, and I'm here with Gary. How are you doing, Gary? I'm doing great, Andrea. Proud of you. This is an insane event. Hello to everybody. I know we've got like 5,000 people and incredible guests, and so I'm thrilled to be here, Andrea. Marketing for the Now, is a, it's a six-part series, and in future episodes, we're going to double down on a whole bunch of different topics like Gen Z, e-commerce, the shifting media landscape, gaming and esports, and a lot more. Uh, as a diehard sports fan, you know, 19-year-old me is losing his mind right now. Uh, and so, uh, Alex, thanks for being here. What blows me away about you is not only you are you an actual Hall of Fame athlete, which is such rarefied air, but as I've gotten to know you over the last three or four years, your ambition and entrepreneurial savvy is gonna put you eventually in the Entrepreneurial Hall of Fame. How, what are you leaning into as an entrepreneur during this period that we're all dealing with? What is kind of, what's manifested in these last 75 days from a personality trait? Yeah, look, Gary, thank you for uh, welcoming me. Um, happy to be here. W one of the things that I'm looking at since we have a, this will be a sprint, not a marathon. Uh, I'll talk in small bites, but the bottom line is Joe Torre, um, my New York Yankee manager taught me, Alex, when you have a rain delay, those that go in the back room and eat burgers and pizzas and fries end up like zeros. You stay prepared, keep your jersey on, get on the bike, stay warm, keep your mind in the game. And then when you go out there, you're gonna close like a champion. I am looking at this COVID-19 as a rain delay. The game's not over, we will continue. And whoever's best prepped in this time will win later. So I'm preparing for later and I'm positioning my company for to be in a better position than we were before. How do you translate that energy as somebody who's lived it, is in that mindset to your direct reports and the individuals in your ecosystem who, let's just shoot it straight, may not have the financial you know, stability that you have you know, to invest mentally in the long term how do you impose that on somebody who might be making, you know, 70K a year or 200K a year, but has expenses? Like that's been a big thought of mine. Have you been thinking about that? Well, I've done two things and we have teams all over the place. We have a big team in New York, big team in LA and, and obviously here in South Florida. Uh, we have not cut one person. We haven't cut 1% of one salary. And the reason why, uh, even though uh, it's justified in this moment to do that because obviously the income and the revenue is not the same. I wanted to make sure that at the darkest moment, uh, A Rock Corp shined and we were there for them. What um, what about what's going on in the sports business world? Obviously, we've got a lot of CMOs on the back, so I want to fill out this program. Anything stand out in sports right now? How are you thinking about sports? Uh, what what are we going to see from when is it coming back? What what's what's some of your hot takes and understandings? You know, there, there's some some people out there, whether it's business or sports teams, that that love debt are <laughs> are uh, in those teams uh, could be in some trouble because the loss of revenues uh, are going to be massive, more than people can even imagine, and they'll trickle down to 21 and 22. Um, what's interesting is some businesses like Michael Rupino over at um, Live Nation, one of the best CEOs around. Uh, more than 90% of the people have not wanted a refund. So that's great news for Live Nation, great wow. news for Michael is that, the, is that the number that's being thrown around? 90% have kept, and which tells you people love live experiences, they're gonna feel good. This is their comfort food. Oh, they can't wait. They're not giving up that ticket to Bon Jovi or Beyonce or Jay-Z or J-Lo, whoever it is. That number, Gary, stood out to me. 90% kept their tickets, impressive. Hello, What's Gary. Up? How are you, my man? Good, my brother. How are you doing? Marcel, I, I find you to be one of the more creative uh, CMOs that I work with. Um, how, how important is creativity? You know, though subjective, right? Beauty in the eye of the be beholder. But when, when I say the word creativity, how do you think of that as the, one of the most important CMOs in the world on, on some of the most iconic brands in a category that has a lot of permission to be creative? Uh, well, thanks for the uh, for, for the words, Gary, uh, and hello again. Uh, I think that creativity nowadays is kind of your ticket to play, because we were just talking about how many social platforms you have to work with, and uh, and how much people are going through second screens, third screens, 
endless screens. Like unless you, you are creative, you don't grab people's attention. And therefore, you don't even start a conversation. And therefore, you do not exist. <laughs> yep. Uh, optimism has has been very obvious to me observing from afar. You, you know, for, for disclosure for everybody, we work with Highball, we work with uh, Budweiser in the domestic market. Uh, most of the brands within the ABI portfolio, other agencies work with Marcelon. And I've been very fond of some of the work across the board, obviously very proud of our Budweiser work. But Marcel, it seems that optimism through the lens of entertainment has been a theme that I've noticed from even the work, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily talk about that. I, I think, you know, am I right? Is that, you know, I'm, I'm kind of watching. It, it seems like you've doubled down on this during this time. Am I pinning it? Am I not? Like thoughts when I say that? I think you're completely right, Gary. Uh, uh, for a simple reason, we're humans. Uh, and especially in times like this, we all need some optimism. Like if you turn on the TV, you're going to watch the news all the time. It's all about how many people are dying, right? That's all the that people consume. Uh, so we need more than ever some optimism. We need to see the bright side. We need to see, we, we need to enjoy all the opportunities we can. And also we need to talk a little bit about how do we get out of this in a better way so that we can make good plans instead of just being consumed by fear. Uh, and this takes us to, to, to something that you mentioned in the beginning, like people centricity, right? It, it applies to creativity and to anything we need to do in marketing. If there's one thing that for me, it, it's like we've just reached the point of no return is on people centricity. Like yeah. if, if there's any people, any person or any company still trying to do something because this is what I think is best for me, but without making sure that it's what people are really expecting or without being sure that it's relevant for people, it's, it's gone. Optimism is something that people care about now, maybe more than ever. You, you have to over communicate, I guess, with your mm -hmm. team. Over communicating in times like this is crucial. And you have to be obsessed about okay. consumer information. So the more you understand which are the shifts that people are making, the more confident you get about the pivots you need to make. So instead of talking too much about what if this, what if that, let's test three options, you say from here to there, this is it, let's go. You become more decisive. We are live. We raced last night. It was about midnight. We got kind of wrapped up. We had a little weather, which kind of at least provides a little bit of normalcy to us. Weather's never our friend. But, you know, we went back racing on May 17th, which was last Sunday, um, put together an amazing event. Um, no fans. First time ever in our history to not race in front of fans. Um, had to do it with an absolutely a procedure and policy that turned upside down, but we were able to deliver live sports to an amazing audience on Sunday and then again last night. And, you know, obviously we all know we're sports fans. Um, you know, the public is starved for live sports content. Uh, so we knew going into it, we had a huge responsibility, but we had a huge opportunity to bring back live sports. And, and we knew we were going to have our core fans there. Uh, they've been dying for us to come back, but we knew we were going to have a whole new set of eyeballs, curious about what NASCAR is all about, trying to understand what we were all about, um, and just consume sports. So it was a ton of work trying to get to this point. We're all navigating through a new normal. Marcel said it, you said it. Um, nothing is the same, um, but the core product that we have is the same. And so we're just trying to figure out how to deliver it to all of these new fans at a time when um, they are open to receiving it. So it's it's been a great experience so far. Get us down and dirty to as much as you're willing. I want to get, I'm, I'm really, you know, this is why I decided to host it because I want to go there. How insane were the conversations you know, leading up to that decision, being the first, like literally, I am such a fearless, you know, kind of character. And literally that last week, I told my operating team, we will not be the first people back in the office in New York because of fear, because I don't want to be first. I don't want to be first. I want to be the fast follower. It's incredible the courage it took for you to go there. How, how contentious with your fellow C-suite executives, how much fear, the, you know, the teams carry a lot of weight, yep. you got the, the Gibbs and the, this and like, what was, give me, give me something, yeah. give me an exclusive here, Jill. I'm trying to make this Vayner X thing, marketing for now, like yeah. a hot thing. Like I need an exclusive here that travels oh. kind of sports business journal. Give me, give me a nugget, help me here, Jill. 
Oh, I'll give you the scoop. I will say, Gary, there were probably 68 different versions of a schedule to come back. And we were in debates on the governor of South Carolina versus the governor of Pennsylvania and Tennessee and, and really being caught in all of this political conversation. It must, it must that must have gotten gnarly. You try to stay out of that. You're being you know, concerned that you're being kind of put into a situation um, that you don't want to be in. I think we had just had to stick to okay, what is physically possible. And to your point, we are an industry that is very fragmented. We have a ton of different stakeholders. Everybody's got an opinion. Um, and I will say that piece was pretty gratifying. You know, everybody wanted to go back racing. Um, everybody, I think, had the butterflies. Someone said it the other day in one of our meetings. You know, we finally feel like a driver feels when he's strapping into the car. Uh, you know, for the Daytona 500, that's how we felt going back racing because it was a huge risk. You guys talked about risk in this last panel. And, you know, it is much, I guess, easier to be that fast follower. Um, but we knew 100%. that we had to be bold. We had a chance. We had to take it. And, uh, you know, it actually went much more smoothly than we could have hoped. But every single week, every time we do it, there's a new set of parameters. And that's the hardest part about state what we're all state, navigating right? through. State by state. It's constantly changing. And it's all, there's no consistency. It's kind of, you know, at the decision of folks that you don't have any influence over. Um, so it's been an interesting, you know, usually we have this cadence, we know where we're going to race and what we're going to do. You know, we're all planners. We kind of know uh, what we have to deliver. And this has been, okay, whatever you did yesterday, rip it up because we're starting from square one again today. And that's been the two months of, of work that's gone into it. Let's get right into it. You had a major event and you moved very quickly, set it up for everybody. And then more importantly, because I think a lot of people have to pivot and this may or may happen again, what did you do? How did it go down? How can you move such a big thing so fast? So on uh, March 2nd, our conference was supposed to be March 31st in Las Vegas, the worst possible place for a COVID pandemic. And so on March 2nd, we sent out an email saying we're not going to be able to have it, but we will do a virtual conference, which was completely unplanned. So 29 be days before. Uh, we were expecting 23,000 people in Vegas. It's a, it's a very long-standing event, 15 years, so people really look forward to it. So we were going to go... I, I, and just for context, I apologize because I want people to know, what do, what do you do there? Oh, we have three days of content. So all of our executives introduce new technology. That's on the first day. The second day, we have inspirational speakers. So we were going to have Tom Brady, Gwyneth Paltrow, and um, Hardy. <laughs> I, like I hate Tom Brady. I, I love Brady. Gwyneth. I like Gwyneth. Gwyneth is my favorite person. Tom Brady, I want to punch in the face. Ah. Sorry, Jet fan talking. Go ahead. That's okay. I'm trying to stomach your Jets. Um, Respect. Uh, Are you a Pats fan? No. I'm uh -oh. a Niners fan. Well, we don't have a rivalry, Anne. <laughs> We're different, separate divisions. Okay. I was, I'm from New York, so I was a New York Giants fan. So uh, keep I'm going. Keep but going. Um, on March, uh, so we were planning to shoot it in our office because we didn't have a shelter in place at that point. So we picked March 11th to shoot the whole thing. March 11th, they shut down the entire state of California. And so we couldn't do anything in the office. And we had this big production that we were going to try and replicate in San Jose. Long story short, uh, the next, what, 20 days, we had to shoot every single thing at home. So my boss, the CEO, has to shoot his segment, uh, the head of technology. We got under the wire, we got Tom Brady, sorry. Um, <laughs> we had a video crew there in Florida where he was and we were able to shoot him. We had 150 breakout sessions that um, were videotaped on um, Zoom. And uh, we opened it up, so we advertised it just like we were before. We opened it up at 8 a.m. There were 17,000 people waiting there before we even opened up the conference. And over the next two weeks, 400,000 people viewed the content. So we got way more people. It wasn't the perfect format because, you know, we had three weeks. Two seconds. Um, but I was shocked that, you know, we were able to do it at all. And people were so appreciative, like the regular folks who've been going for years and years. They're like, thank you, it was good. Normal and thing. Was, yeah, and we documented the whole process because so many people have been asking us, how, how the hell did you do this? 
And so we're documenting it. We're building a virtual events platform because, oh, by the way, all of our conferences now are canceled through the end of the year. I don't think we will maybe have as many events as we previously did. We'll have certainly a much bigger virtual component. Um, you know, the social feed, all of that is still very vibrant. We're going to try and shoot more things live. We didn't have time to do live and it was really hard. Uh, but I think there'll be a change. There's never been more creativity than now. Um, we just provisioned 30 million students uh, who don't have Creative Cloud at home so they can learn at home. Explain uh, to everybody what that means because that's an amazing initiative and I just want, you know, there's a lot of people that don't even know what that actually means. Let's break that down in like proper yeah. English, like it literally how much of an investment that is in reality of what you're actually doing, which is incredible. So uh, schools and particularly in some underserved communities may have Creative Cloud access at the actual school but when kids go home, they might not be able to use the software. So what we did was pick um, 30 million students across different school districts and we gave them the software for free indefinitely. For the people in the back, <laughs> how many per week? 30,000 workshops a week in real life experiences around the world. And the product and tech and brand team, we pivoted to say, well, wait a minute, like we're a community. We can't just walk away from these, you know, from all of our members. And so within six days, we had migrated all of those workshops to virtual workshops. We trained thousands of coaches and we were up and running, which is- Gail, yeah, tell is, the truth. Get, tell the truth. How ugly did you think it was gonna be? And you're like, you know, you're brushing your teeth, you're, you're working out, you're thinking about this. I, I, I know you, you're meticulous, tease eyes, thinking about it every second. And you definitely are thinking like, man, a lot of these people have never used Zoom or Google Hang, like on some real, real talk, how petrified were you that it was gonna be a burning disaster? Petrified, totally petrified. But, and, and Gary, I know this sounds trite, but we, like we were really doing this because we were really nervous about our members not having their community and we were really trying to do the right thing. And I, I do believe in karma and I believe when you're doing the right thing, like we had some angels on our wings and we had a ton of people who, I, I have never ever worked for a company where the people in my company, they almost care too much. I, I'm worried about people burning out because right. people overnight, our product, our tech, it was like, we are gonna make this happen. And, and the teams, I mean, talk about having focus, having clarity, having purpose and passion. And, and it just, it, it was pretty amazing. Hmm. Gail, what, what has been the biggest surprise? Pro and con, I need a con from you, Gail. No softballs here. You know, pro and con, biggest surprise so far, the organization, the business, the, the realities of what you're dealing with at this high of a level of such a big company. Um, I think the, the pro, pro has been um, just like, we are all on a mission. It, it, we are a very purpose-driven company. So I think when you have, like we, we have purpose and we're trying to make a profit and the two of those things just come together really, really well. Um, and I think that is, is the, the pro. Um, you know, I think the con, um, people, when they care so much, they take everything so personally. And um, that's, that's hard, especially I'm a hugger, I'm a toucher, I'm a come here. And like when you're trying to manage teams on Zoom where it's like, you know, I just want to hug you, Gary, I miss you, you know? I get it. It's hard, it's very, that's the biggest challenge for me. It's like, I want to climb through the computer and I can't. Give us an insight to the insanity that you must be seeing uh, with all this potential growth that I'm assuming that you're going to now confirm or not confirm. Oh yeah, no, I mean, you, you said it. It's insane. This is record breaking. You, you realize this is the time of the year where a lot of, not a lot of games come out. This is right. a quiet time of the year. This is when okay. you know sport, sports are are you know in their late stages and uh, and everybody's getting geared up for the games that are coming in the fall. Um, and we're having record breaking engagement at this time of the year. And what's cool is we're seeing not only veterans come back and play more of the games they love, we're seeing so many new people play games for the very first time. And so uh, that's a and, and, and how are you see, how are you seeing that? Just straight registrations to the platform. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, realize 
We have, uh, you know, we see about 300 million people a year who are all registered with electronic cards. So when we see tens of millions of new people coming in that we've never seen before, it's very obvious. And then we also see people who haven't played Madden in three years who are back playing Madden. People who haven't played FIFA, they're back playing FIFA. And the Sims community is fucking off the charts. <laughs> That's so cool. So Chris, what's been the biggest challenge? You know, you're more virtual than we are, which is the beauty of your business. Yeah. Uh, but have you had logistics issues of hyper growth? Yeah, well, of course. I mean, um, just keeping up with online volumes is, uh, isn't is always a problem, but this year particularly, in this time particularly challenging, you know, how do we manage all of that? But also developers used, used to be able to make a game and then take some time off and then gear up for the next game. Now they're developing year round. And the same is true for the marketers. We're driving events and events and events. Like when this thing started and got serious in March, you know, we'd already seen it happen because we, we have major operations in Shanghai and in Korea. And so we knew this was coming and we just pivoted to start generating events almost every single day. Um, and that, so what's the downside? People are tired. Like this has been going on for a while and we are just lining up event after event after event. But I gotta tell you, while we're tired, we're also, we recognize this is our time. The moment, this is your, yeah, go ahead. Now is a time when champions are built. Hell yeah, now is a time when champions are built. What are you sensing? I'm sensing that the trends that were happening before COVID have just accelerated in, in some cases, taking five to 10 years of innovation that likely would have taken five to 10 years of innovation and are happening in weeks, if not days. And it's happening across every single vertical. We're gonna come out of this COVID period of time with consumer behavior is fundamentally changed. Now, you've been on the forefront, Gary, about talking about consumer behavior for years. And to some degree, I think we even at Facebook get sick of saying our own story. Hey, consumers have shifted to mobile. There's a new behavior. And now I think the world can't deny it. Grandparents know how to order their groceries and have them delivered to their doorstep. I can use wine text and press a number and have bottles of wine delivered to my door. These are behaviors that are not going away in a post-COVID world. If anything, the innovation has just accelerated rapidly. So we are seeing many big companies leaning into direct-to-consumer campaigns, leaning into changing their business models. Some move faster than others. But what, what I am hearing is bureaucracy is melting down. Companies yes. finding their voice. Speak. The velocity, right? The velocity is just there. Like we. You can't afford to, to be to be late to this game. Mark said in January, it was one of the very best questions, I think he, and he's a very, as you know, very astute, asked a lot of great questions. He asked the question of the senior team, what do we need to do today so that we don't regret not doing it in two to four weeks? And that's when COVID Love. started in China, right? And what he was saying to his team, to all of us, was what do we need, like, we have to move now so that in two to four weeks, we're not like, oh shit, we should have actually moved a hell of a lot faster four weeks ago. And I think that's a really powerful question for every size business. What's the biggest thing that marketers and the consumer world doesn't know about Snap? I'd say the one insight that you would find really interesting that's probably not well known is that the, the scale of the platform. One example of that, is that in the US, Snap has more, uh, a larger community of 25 plus people than Twitter has in all of the US. Say it one more time for people to hear. I'll say it one more time for the people in the back. Because Snap is known as a platform for, for, for younger folks. We have more people in the US 25 plus than Twitter has in all of the US, all ages. So, and, and what is that grounded in? Is that grounded in downloads US active? That's that's down that's grounded in daily active users versus Twitter's version of the monetizable daily active users. So it's it's, it's an apples apples yep. apple comparison. So the, the scale is actually tremendous, and and part of the reason for that is that um, it's a private platform. Yeah. Snap is a closed platform. So um, understanding the user experience only happens when you're actually using the platform, which is not true for Twitter, not true for Instagram, not true for Facebook. They're which all changes, feed based which platforms. Changes the, which changes the vi viral loop, which makes yeah. it deeper, but maybe not as wide potentially, but to your point, wider than most think. 
what's on your mind for this thing? What, what's like, what's like, what is a top priority for Kenny and Snap during this six, seven, eight, 12, 18 week period? Like what's kind of, when I say what's on your mind yeah. and putting on your professional app, what, what kind of comes to the top? You know, um, the, the thing that's been the biggest priority for us has been kind of embracing the responsibility that we have um, to support our community. A communication um, highway. Yeah. Which, it's important. It's a responsibility. Well, well, well also with uh, the, the Snapchat generation, right? So they're, 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 they're younger folks, right? So think of uh, yeah. Gen Z, think of younger millennials. That's kind of like the, the bread and butter of, of yep. who, who yep. makes up our, our, our community. And making sure that we are um, providing them the education, providing them the inspiration, providing them the engagement. It, it, it actually, as, as a leadership team and as a company, we've actually felt a, a tremendous um, responsibility um, to help ensure that we're, we're, we're providing the right tools, the right um, education, the right in, in, uh, information um, to, to make sure that our, our community is well supported during such like a tricky time. Is it, if it's a platform that's actually built for communication for those that are closest to you, like, God damn, it could be a more important time to be communicating with those closest to you than right now. Um, so that's been a big focus of ours. Like so many businesses, we saw our e-com business uh, skyrocket um, and, and move to basically every day being a Black Friday. And then the oper operational challenges that come with that, right? We saw competitors move from being two days consistent on delivery to seven to 10 days. And that was an opportunity for us. Um, we've not lost that momentum. We've been able to maintain an average of two to three days. And the way we've been able to do it is not just lean into our distribution centers, but we had been testing in 25 stores using our stores as mini distribution centers so we could ship from store. On a dime, we went national with that. It's like test over, doesn't matter. Approved. Going. Approved, um, right? Um, also then how do you engage your customers and how do you create an experience for them when they, when with the brick and mortar, how do they shop? And even that's varied, right? So. Um, we had started to talk about curbside, um, talk over, approved, clumsy, not the cleanest, uh, you know, version of it, don't have all the technology overlay to it. And, you know, in a week stood up and gone. And now a month and a half later, we've added uh, just arrived technology over top of it so that it is cleaner and it is a better experience. Um, so making those kind of decisions, um, you know, it converting almost feel, people. It almost feels like entrepreneurship injunction because yeah. now you don't have to be fancy corporate slow proper t's and i's you know you were able to quote unquote get away with you know micro losses because nobody was kind of judging seems to have been an injection for a lot of big companies true yeah i think be there and be good enough and have your intent and be authentic in that goes a long way on, on you know is it the cleanest execution right i think the other thing for us is people have to keep in mind we're private equity held were not big, you know, big publicly traded. And so there was an element of that entrepreneurial spirit and startup mindset and in, in, in starting what we're trying to do. Um, we came in, this leadership team came in with a very specific goal to pivot this from a traditional retail business to become a health and wellness company. Um, and, and in doing so, yeah, there'd be retail experiences, but that's not what we get up and do every day. We get up and think about uh, how do we take care of your pet and how do we create a better experience for you? So with that comes that sort of entrepreneurial mindset to your point. Well, I think that caregiving starts at home. Equality in the workplace starts with shared responsibility in the household. And I think that we're seeing, you know, we can talk about all the problems with this pandemic, this crisis, but we can also talk about all the opportunities, which is what you talk about all the time. There's a silver lining of remarkable. And, you know, we can't be looking back at what was and what isn't. You know, when we talk about this new normal or, you know, we're all waiting and watching for what the, hell no, let's create a better normal and let's get rid of the junk in the trunk that we didn't like. This is our moment, you know, Tarek brought that up so brilliantly. This is our moment to take what we want, close that door, open a new one of equal opportunity, equal pay, you know, equal everything. And that starts with what we are experiencing together in our households. Now, I always say quality is a choice, unconscious bias is an excuse. I'm so sick of this word unconscious bias. If you use the word unconscious, you are conscious. 1,000%. Do Love. something. Love. And you know, and I think that that's really what this is all about. You know, we all have the power. And look, if, you, if, you're, if you're a woke org and you talk to them straight as fuck, you got a chance of winning that game. 
Absolutely. And I think they see you as a way that they, you can help drive the change. You have the, the, the platforms and um, the ability to help fuel the progress that they're trying to make. So how do you work together, have similar agendas, fuel their progress? Because together, that's where you can have the impact. Uh, you can uh, definitely have more impact together than they can have on their own. So I think finding the ones who align with your values, align with where you want to go, and building together is something that we're very, very excited about. And this idea of moving from a canvas shoe to a canvas for youth progress, that's sort of like what we've really, really embedded in this idea that, you know, Converse was about self-expression. These kids want to have self-expression with intent. They want self-expression with intent that leads to, you know, that leads to progress. So that's something that we're really focused on. How do we find these youth, these individuals who are driving progress, using creativity as their as their tool and fueling that and working together to create this future? I think Shelly also said it, you know, this is not about a creating a new a back to normal. This is about using the opportunity to create a new future that is not normal. What's your mindset when you attack something like Super Bowl or, or or some of the other bigger things that you sponsor. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, and I, I have a mindset where you know a lot of people look at these big events as just a big pool of eyeballs, and that is not how I look at it. Um, I look at it as they're relevant eyeballs, and they're thinking about it in a different way. And this idea, you know, I preach this thing to my team around being culture in versus brand out, and a lot of people talk about you know what that means is a lot of brands will say I'm a brand X I have my objective to do whatever I'm gonna find this audience oh look a lot of them are here to let me say this to them I say hey think about the cultural context of this environment all these people are having a shared experience wanting to do this how do you take that and start there and then bring your brand overlay on top and connect to it and actually that mindset has actually been helpful as we think about things like COVID and you think of the path forward of you know how people are gonna fill the void and all these things that are created of you're seeing it right now with the graduation thing that just happened and mm -hmm. you know all these other things and like I said summer barbecues what are those going to be like and people going to the beach and just you start with understanding that cultural context to then figure out how you kind of connect with it and so that's when we think about big events like Super Bowl and all that we always start with that and make sure just the things we're doing we're going to be relevant to that audience at that time. It's so elfing frustrating for me that when people like I've watched everybody talk about being consumer centric and literally I believe that 87% of the people I interact with, clients, non-clients, pitches, are the antithesis of that. It is complete PowerPoint, reporting, ivory tower, complete lack of pulse, six years ago consumer shit. Like, do you agree? A hundred percent. Everybody says it. It's like everything that I've realized that out, like out there in the corporate world, they say it, they don't do it and they say it 95% of the time. It's 95% talking, 5% acting at Elf. We are 100% acting. And we're just on this constant thread of start with a consumer insight. Our entire Elfing Amazing campaign, which we launched last June, we called it a brand recharge, was all built on the back of consumer insights. We found patterns, threads, what is it that they love about our brand? What is it that excites them about our brand? And created an entire campaign off of those threads and patterns. What platforms are exciting you? Where do you see some arbitrage? Where do you see the consumer at the center being interesting? I, I mean, I, you know you know what's gonna come out of my mouth. TikTok is by far the most exciting platform that there is, has been for over a year and will continue to be on the road ahead. The work that we've done together with them, the way in which we've been able to propel our brand forward and into an, an entire new sphere is just truly exceptional. How did you think about advertising during the period? Did you, are you, like how'd you go that route? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for a little while we were quiet um, and and I think rightly so. I mean, every, every brand has to do what's right for them and I saw some beautiful things from different brands. For us, I think we needed to kind of get a wits, our wits about us, if you will. The aviation thing is it was pretty big, right? And and frankly, we've had to take some hard actions. We've had to uh, announce layoffs. That just didn't feel like the moment to be out there, at least to me. So what we've started is, and again, we're just talking about this morning, is kind of started, Gary, um, small and agile so uh, this is going to sound like super small but maybe for some of the folks listening it'll resonate so you know when i think about reasons to believe in our company it's our technology it's our people it's our global footprint so we kind of said well our people um or don't get to work from home they're in factories right a lot of them they're making things they're helping keep the lights on quite yep. literally literally 
Quite literally, exactly. Like you can do with a lot without a lot of things in a pandemic. You can't do without power. So we took a digital billboard in Greenville, South Carolina, outside of our plant, and we celebrated the workers. We put their pictures wow. there so that they could see it and everybody else could see it. Selfies and all this. It's nice. Exactly. It's the whole smart. thing. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't people, feel small. It doesn't, doesn't feel, feel small. small. It feels smart. And now we're going to do this in multiple markets, not just in the U.S., but in other parts of the world. But to me, that's important. Another one, just bringing it back to you, which I love doing, is you know taking a page out of what you and the team helped us with last year, which I always find interesting because people are like, oh, you know, big industrial brand, how do you make it human? Well, last year, as you know, we let our employees take over our social media feeds and it was like a friggin' home run, right? So now we're thinking about how do we, knowing our employees are a reason to believe that they are what literally our customers need and depend on 24 seven, how do we put them out front? And it's an interesting time, Gary, because the lines were getting blurred, right? Like something that we might've done three months ago and only done internally and shared internally, we're kind of saying to ourselves, that may be authentic, more empathetic. Why don't we share it externally? So, you know, am I booking dates to be on Sunday Night Football? I wish I were watching Sunday Night Football. I don't know what they're going to look like. Will we be back out there? We'll be back out there. But we're taking, in some ways, baby steps. I, I like what you said. I think it's small but smart.